Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. And I am Kathleen Johnson. I'm a co-founder with the Calgary Urban Species Response Team. I'm joined by Marissa Go, who is one of our great volunteers. She is a co-lead of the education program alongside Ann Berner, who's not able to be with us tonight, but big thanks to Marissa and Ann for all the coordination that you do. And we're very excited to welcome Simone Lee, who is the president of Friends of Confederation Creek. Thank you so much, Simone. Before, Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness, so excited. Um, and before we go on to let you do your presentation, Simone, I just wanted to share that of course um, we do, you know, one of our, our chief values here is to support truth and reconciliation. And so in the spirit of truth and reconciliation at Calgary Urban Species Response Team, we strive to reduce urban risk to wildlife, support mindful care of local ecology, and share meaningful opportunities to learn together and encourage participation. We gratefully acknowledge the Indigenous peoples and traditional lands of the Blackout Confederacy, the Gaidai, the Siksiga, the Begani, as well as the Yaxi Nagoda, the Sutina Nations, and Metis Nation of Alberta Region Number Three. Simone, it is great to have you. And you, I have to say too, you've been such a wonderful supporter. We started this three-part series of Wildlife Wednesdays so that we could bring attention to different issues that are happening in the area. And you came to all of those and I'm really grateful to you and everybody else who did that. But I'm, you know, it's so good to see support from the community when you're already busy working on your own um, focused interests and to also come out and learn from and support other people doing the same. Like that, that's really appreciated. So well, I'm really grateful to have you tonight. So we get to learn about your efforts and all of this work. Well, I mean, I really firmly believe that it's all connected and that we're all working towards the sort of same ends. Um, and uh, this has been a six year long endeavor for me now. Um, so I know that it takes time and if there's something that you know, I can I can offer, um, um, I'm always happy to do so, but I learn a lot from everything else that I go to. But um, tonight I'm here at your gracious invitation, um, but also <laughs> because the timing works out really, really nicely um, because we are just launching the Friends of Confederation Creek's latest endeavor, which is this infographic, um, infographic slash map that was made possible by a grant from the Land Stewardship Center. Um, and so what we decided to do is to highlight where the creek is in Calgary. And so one full slide back to the map now we can see this. Oh, fantastic just how far and wide ranging um, Confederation Creek is. So now I'm going to start sharing my screen and I'm going to be hopping between my PowerPoint and websites that I've set up to share with you. Uh, I see a question here, is the map online? The map is going to be online. Um, it is a huge file. And so our new website uh, to support it, we we're just getting into that. But I have 5,000 copies of this. So if anybody would like one, you can contact me afterwards and we'd be happy to send it out to you for just the cost of postage or whatever. Um, that looks great. Okay. So here I go. I am sharing my screen. Perfect. Let me know if you have any trouble. All right. Do you guys all see your beautiful selves? We see your beautiful screen and your yeah. beautiful self. Okay. Do you see Uncovering Confederation Creek? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. So people are most familiar with Confederation Creek when it runs through Confederation Park. Um, but people don't know um, just how far and wide Confederation Creek goes. Um, and 
I thought that this sign that um, someone who has become a trusted friend um, placed in Confederation Creek um, was an apt way to begin because this is where the creek goes underground again at 30th Avenue near the playground um, in Confederation Park, the one that they rebuilt for the Sesky Centennial. Um, so that's at 30th Avenue Northwest. I'm adapting um, a presentation that I made for city councillors and other city people um, just to explain to them the background of Confederation Creek because the reason the creek came to my attention was because of this um, drainage study um, and that was done because of proposed development in the Highland um, Valley. And I'm going to go and show you this first site. Do you see Highland Park land use amendment? Yes, we do. So the Highland Park um, golf course was a private golf course, privately owned, um, that fills the land between 4th Street Northwest and um, Center Street, just south of McKnight Boulevard. Um, it's sort of difficult to see in it, and you'll drive by and you may not even be aware that it's there, but it is over 40 acres of land that was bought from the um, second owner, um, we'll get to him later, back in 2013 um, for a steal of a deal. I think he paid $7.1 million for 40 acres of prime inner city land. Um, and when I heard tell that this was happening, it's not in my community, I live in an, an adjacent community. I thought, well, this is gonna be really cool. Um, going to be able to see like a little new neighborhood being created within a neighborhood. Um, and so I went to the open houses and, and talked with the city representatives who were there presenting it. Um, but one of the first questions I asked them was, um, you know, they showed a slide uh, and I said, you know, what, what about the creek that runs through there? And they're like, oh yeah, that, that's, we're not talking about the creek. Um, and as you can see, it's in, in this curved shape here. And it was proposed to be developed in several different lots. Um, and they divided the area into, I think, five different sections based on sort of the, what they wanted to do. The first proposal was to um, fill in the valley three to five meters with fill and build 12 story um, apartment buildings on top. Um, so it'd be basically erasing the valley that's there um, and then um, peeking head and shoulders up uh, around the, the community around it. Um, you probably would probably would almost be able to see it from downtown. Um, there was pushback on that proposal from the communities, um, both Highland Park and Thorncliffe Greenview. And um, they asked for some further setbacks and for height diminishments. And so this plan went through a number of different amendments. Um, and then um, they also offered up public space for um, the community to use. Um, but one of the things that the site features is they were going to put a road smack dab in the middle of the valley hmm. um, to gain access to Center Street here. And this down here is 40th Avenue. And this is 4th Street. So just for clarity, this is currently still a golf course? This is currently still undeveloped. Still, okay. I'm going to actually pull up a map so that I can envision it. And if anybody, I'll put the 
the link if anybody wants to open it. So you said oh, yes. Center and, Street and 40th, right? Yes. Marissa, if you want to share, um, I've got a bunch of places that we're going to be visiting tonight. So if you want to share those um, links, then everybody can go and take a peek on their own as we're going through. Awesome. And I see she's already got, got that going. That's awesome. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the valley is um, quite steep. And so like this is a grade that's over, um, I think over 30% drop. And this is also a very large grade. Um, what's up here is you might be familiar with the emergency services um, at the corner of um, Fourth Street and McKnight. Yeah. And that's some um, city land there that's um, being given to them. Um, and so this went through the Calgary Planning Commission and um, got tweaked several times. It um, got discussed at council a couple of times and then the public hearing happened. And it was um, at the time of the public hearing that I realized that um, the community was having trouble expressing what their concerns were. And so I offered to write press releases for them. Um, and I soon found out that there was more than enough for three press releases. So we did some just about land use. We did some about green space because Highland Park, even though it's got park in the name, has the least green space of any community in Calgary, I think. Um, they are severely underrepresented for green space. Um, and But the final one was water. And then it was really the water one that um, became um, the most um, gripping for me. Um, so we went and um, talked at the um, public hearing. Um, I think we had about 45 people come and do presentations of various sorts. And then we watched the following day as one by one, they approved every single one of the bylaw amendments, changing this area from recreational special use to, to direct control oh. with one proviso that um, no development could be done until the city of Calgary did a stormwater study of the area, which they said had never been done before. Um, and that nothing could happen, no stripping or grading or filling or anything like that could happen until that um, study was completed. Um, and so we wrote this uh, overview for the counselors as they were going to go um, and look at this study. And we'll come back to that study later. Um, but basically what they found was that um, Confederation Creek um, is in the largest watershed in Calgary by like a magnitude of 10 times the size of any other watershed in Calgary. It is enormous. And one of the reasons it's so big is because it is in the North Hill Coulee. Um, and people have known about the North Hill Coulee. I'm going to bring you here to this groundwater resources of the city of Calgary and vicinity that was published in 1968, 61. Um, and it is studying the topography of Calgary and all around Calgary. Um, and has been the go-to document um, to consult um, about um, you know, what, what kind of soil you find um, in and, and how much water there is and um, even stream flow analysis. Um, and you, you see here that they say, you know, that, that the Bow River Valley is, is a good place to develop groundwater and surface water. And it's economically a very fair, favorable situation because they, they know that Calgary is semi-arid. As we all know, Calgary is semi-arid. So this is a photograph I took um, in the Glenbow archives when I've got my hands on a copy 
of um, Bulletin 8. And this is a large oversized map. So I, I apologize for the quality of this thing. I'll, I'll go to a close up sooner and with the legend, but I just want to get you an idea of where the North Hill Cooley is. So this where I'm scrolling over here is um, Nose Hill. And oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. This over here is Nose Hill. This is the Bow River. And the different colors are to discuss what, um, how much groundwater is in the ground there. Um, and so the lightly shaded means that there's, there's water in the ground around. Um, and then the orange shows much more. And then here you can see this is actually downtown Calgary. And when people tell you that downtown Calgary is built on an aquifer, that's because there's literally water flowing underneath downtown Calgary. But our North Hill Cooley is this one. And you can see its distinctive that, shape tucked in around. That is so interesting. Around the bottom of, of Nose Hill. Um, so it runs um, from, that was Rocky View County at that time. And it runs down to um, Nose Creek. And you think of Nose Creek as this teeny tiny little creek, but you can see that even in 1961, um, they recognize even it, the Deerfoot Valley is where Nose Creek runs, ran. Nose Creek created that entire valley. Um, and so what's left of it um, is, is still in the rock and, and the, the ground soils. Um, so I'll move ahead. And um, you can see that here they're talking about um, what types of deposits are there. And so they, they surveyed all of Calgary and, and did this all many, many years ago. The um, portion that we're interested in is here in the North Hill Cooley. And they note that there are surface springs that were just flowing off of uh, Nose Hill in various places. These are silver springs going down into Bowness. And this is something that comes into the Cooley. And then these here, these little hatch marks here, are the edge of the river valley. And it's called a coulee because it's a, a geological formation that's caused by a glacier. So of course there's water in a glacier. Um, and I don't think that groundwater attainable at 50 to 100 gallons per minute in 1961 is really anything to sneeze at. Um, so as I said, this coulee is the largest catchment. Um, and uh, what people don't understand is that it starts at the very tippy top of Nose Hill. Um, and when the city provided us this map that we used um, for our infographic, it actually starts up in Edgemont and it travels all the way across down to Edmonton Trail. And now I could spend the rest of the evening showing you guys this map, which is one of the fabulous things that the city of Calgary does, um, is that they make all of this wonderful imagery. Oh. Um, so you can see here, I'll zoom out a little bit. This is we're back to Nose Hill here. And I'll bring us in here. And one really cool feature of this map, I'm just gonna go up a little bit, is that you can um, look at this map um, in various years that they have aerial imagery for. Um, wow. So this is this is present day um, Calgary, and so this is Confederation Park here. Hmm. And you'll get used to seeing this shape a lot. So you just go in here and you can check which layer you want to look at. And if you take away 2014, and you can go back in time. Whoa. You can go back in time. I, I was able to go back in time to 1924, but I'll, I'll start in 1948 because it's still pretty impressive. This is what Calgary looked like in 1948. Um, 
And so you can see that already the march of development is starting up Center Street here. And that is, there's already quite a bit of housing around here. You can see the farmer's fields still all around. Um, and all of these darker lines here indicate water. So this is all the water that's coming down off of Nose Hill and being used by these farmers, clearly. Um, but you can also see the beginnings of the creek going in here. There's quite a big reservoir there and going down and around. A really dramatic change already is 1962, where you can see that development has come above the creek now and it's really starting to be ringed in and you can zoom in and get quite high quality wow Ex no sound on here either what picture it's not working i Man. can hear you and your microwave um and so you see these are these are possibly not creeks that run year round. It, it's difficult to tell what time of year this was taken. It was probably summer, um, but these dark lines and you can see the vegetation that comes along with them. Um, and as I tell people, I say, you know, every wavy line in Calgary, Northern Calgary was a creek because what the developers did was just go into those natural contours that were already there and just paved them over. Um, so here, sorry, now I have to come back and orient myself. Uh. But here we are, um, this is the North Hill Coulee, which by this time has become basically a dump. Um, like just like Nose Creek became a dump, that's what people used to do. You know, you'd go to the, the edge of the of the coulee and you'd just tip your garbage over and walk away, you were done, right? Um, and people were starting to complain about it because there was all of this development around it and around a dump, essentially, and and, and people didn't like that very much. Um, you can see here. Um, this is as it approaches into Queens Park Cemetery and they're just building the first roads into Queens Park Cemetery. Um, and there's a beautiful creek in Queens Park Cemetery that they took great pains. Sadly, in this picture, there's a cloud over it, but this is, this is a creek that you can still go and visit to this day because the custodians or the superintendents of Queen's Park um, didn't, um, didn't want to cover it up. Um, just over here, there used to be a commercial market garden, um, the Hop Low Market Garden that existed for a long, long time um, until the city flooded it out when they put the creek, which you see here, this is Confederation Creek, underground to go underneath um, 4th Street to accommodate the building of James Fowler High School. Um, and so James Fowler um, opened, I think it was 1966 or so, um, but you can see clearly where the creek is going here and passing under, there used to be a bridge on 4th Street um, and they let it out again here into our famous golf course. You start to recognize the side, the, the shape of it. Um, and so this golf course and all of the land of Highland Park was owned by one Mr. Addison and he was uh, a developer, he was a bon vivant, he was also very litigious. 
And so if you go down and you look in the, in the city files about golf courses, you'll find reams of letters written between him and the city. And he was always complaining about the city and the city was always complaining about him. Um, but we think that he, um, he, he built to the nth degree that he could um, along here. And so he built on this whole toe of this um, escarpment, we call it the toe, um, where the farmer had had his fields previously, he built houses. And then the farmer had grazed his um, cows down in the valley. And people that grew up here tell stories about going down and playing in there and finding cow bones and thinking they were dinosaurs and all sorts of wonderful stuff. There's a lot of longtime residents of this area who are still there and they still remember the creek. Mm. Um, but what happened in 1970 was that there was a catastrophic hill slide on 44th Avenue and there were houses left hanging off the edge of the um, creek and uh, over, over the creek and the city was um, liable for it. No kidding. Not the developer. And so they said, well, that's never going to happen again. And so um, on the taxpayer dime, they entombed the creek and they put it in a vault and ran it all the way through the golf course. So the waters are no longer there. Can you go back to the previous view, please? And then quickly you want to go back to 1960? Just to switch quickly, just to see the before after real quick. So there's the before. Yeah. And then back to 72. Oh, wow. Hmm. Um, one of the interesting things in 1966, also for the area to, to look at and think about is um, there are all of these other creeks that are coming into this area here. Um, and so does anyone recognize what this intersection could be? I'll zoom out a little bit, give you some more context. John Larry Boulevard. Oh. That's oh, McKnight. And, Don, and Donna's guess McKnight. Oh, it's McKnight I was going to say John Larry Boulevard, but it is McKnight, Donna. It, it is you Mc, get the prize. It, this is John Larry Boulevard that would come in later. But this is McKnight before oh, it was built. Okay. And McKnight Boulevard is, as you can see, a creek. No kidding. You get that feeling when you go rushing down McKnight. We always go zoom, wee, as we go around the curves. <laughs> but that's because you're in a creek's coulee. There's also a, um, a creek that comes down here from Eggert's Park that comes into the valley. And I don't know if you guys, when you're on McKnight and you're approaching 4th Street, there's a big um, sinking in the road and you go vroom as you go over it. Well, that's this creek coming in. No kidding. Yeah, so. Um, what was the name of the park again, Kristen was asking? Eggert's Park. Eggert's Park. We also call this Trafford Creek because it runs beside Trafford. Um, and then it, it continued to run up above ground um, down through Greenview. I actually haven't looked at this very much. Is there's, I don't know if the, um, if that, that's, this is the drive-in that is now the, um, site of the um, church, that enormous church. Really? Yeah. Um, people love this driving. And this is Nose Creek over here. So you see it going down and it goes into Nose Creek. And that, we could spend another whole day talking about what happened to Nose Creek because it had much the same fate um, as well. 
Um, but anyways, it's, it's, for us, it's really good to know that we have this aerial imagery um, going back as early as 1924 um, for the entire area. How far back, like if you were to go out, like is it strictly the city of Calgary limits or does it, like if it, you zoom entirely out, does it show any of other parts of Southern Alberta or is that map strictly Calgary? This is strictly Calgary. I'll get rid of this thing and I'll take us a little bit closer in time. And you can visit any neighborhood you want. Wow. Mm, okay. Well, the detail is restricted to there, which makes yeah. sense. But okay. But um, when they do these aerial surveys, they go zigzagging back and forth, and so we have we have accessed some that are down below outside the city limits. And oh, okay. You just have to know which pass was what area yeah that makes sense anyway so Thank back you. to my powerpoint um the other map that the city has made that we have a few more problems with um is this beautiful map that they created for their um, riparian action program um which is a very commendable program um and they are trying to um bring attention to our four watersheds, five watersheds in the city of Calgary. And you'll see that the Nose Creek watershed is actually um, immense. It's not as big as the Bow River watershed, but Nose Creek watershed actually goes through three different municipalities um, before it gets to Calgary. Um, and they spend a lot of time um, talking about um, the different watersheds in a bit more detail and your they go through each one I'm, I'm going to have to scroll through quickly but if you want to go back it's well worth um, going to take a look um, talking about the different watersheds maybe um, maybe too could you for for those of us who don't know do you mind explain what a riparian area is because we hear yes. that term a lot we've heard that a few uh evenings with the different issues in riparian areas mm -hmm. comes up a lot. So what's the significance of that? Um, the significance of that is, is the riparian area is where control of the land is rest away by the water. Mm -hmm. And so it is where you will see the um, end of ordinary plants and you'll see the beginning of water plants. Um, and so it's not strictly just the bed and shores of um, the, the body of water. Um, it extends as far as those riparian water loving plants go to. Um, and I think with Nose Creek people, we talked about the setbacks that are supposed to happen um, right. to protect those areas because they are fairly vulnerable um, in agriculture. Um, if you um, water your cattle near them, um, you, they, they can get, they call it pugged. The, the cattle's feet actually um, create huge wall, wall, holes in it and it, forces out the water because the the riparian areas are acting like a sponge when the river is high or the creek is high it's mm -hmm. collecting uh, water and keeping it in its banks and then as the water recedes it's letting that water back out into the river and sort of trying to um, keep the the water level um, going um, and so it's a good stabilizer mm -hmm. for water so um, you know, you shouldn't, they say you're not supposed to go walking near the river um, after it's rained because basically you're just squeezing that sponge back into the river when it doesn't need it. Um, also, the plants are fairly unique um, and they don't, they don't do well anywhere else 
um, and um, they're also susceptible like if, if you're breaking the ground or moving the ground um, there are very invasive species that will come in and outcompete our natural riparian plants um, so okay. here is yeah. this here is the city's um, depiction of the Nose Creek watershed. And they go into quite some length talking about where it comes from. It comes close 75 kilometers before it goes into the bowl near the zoo. Um, and they do mention the Confederation Creek drainage basin. Um, they call it a drainage basin. They don't call it a watershed. Um, but they, they talk about West Mills Creek, which is the lovely creek that runs beside Beddington Trail. And they talk about the, the, the communities that uh, contribute water to that. Um, they say that Confederation Creek is bordered by four communities and they leave it there. Whereas it's actually 15 communities oh, wow. that feed into Confederation Creek. And they say most of the riparian areas are designated as parks and open spaces. Um, we know that that's not entirely true. So yeah, we have a few bones to pick um, with the city about that. Pretty picture of West Mills Creek, but nothing of Confederation Creek. Um, but it, it is worthwhile to go and check out um, these, these um, maps if you are further interested. I saw a um, note that somebody was interested in looking at this further. And um, uh, thanks, Marissa, for putting those links in. Um, and if you didn't see the note, sometimes it's hard to copy and paste out of a Zoom chat. So what I recommend doing if you're able to, even if you don't look at it, just click on that link so that it opens in a browser somewhere and keep watching the Zoom. And then when the Zoom's done, then you'll have them saved in the, the browser. And it's an easy way to keep it. And then Marissa also, as long as we've got your approval to do so, someone, she does this really lovely um, summary of the evening and things that we've learned. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure she'll be able to put those links on there too. So that'll be that also. Would be great. Yeah. That would be fabulous. Yeah. Um, I, I knew that it was I knew that it was a bit much, but um, I also thought that it was important. <laughs> oh no, it's um, terrific and it, incredible tools. Thank you. So people say, well, you know, Confederation Creek's just a little creek. What's the big deal? Um, but we we've learned. Um, we have some people. We have. A, couple of really dedicated volunteers who've done a lot of walking and ground truthing of um, Confederation Creek. And they've found more than 40 perennial and intermittent water flows that go into Confederation Creek, um, which make it a pretty high order creek. The more, the more water that joins the creek, the higher the order of the creek is. Um, and we're, actually able to measure a few of them that you can um, get to. Um, and so we just do the bucket method. You put down the bucket and you see how long it takes to fill up and you calculate your water volume um, by that. So by our own measurements, because the city has none, um, we say that there's a million five hundred and seventy six thousand eight hundred cubic meters of water flow through this coulee without the addition of stormwater. Wow. So that's just what's there all the time. So and those says, communities you were saying too, the ones that they listed um, only a few, but there's far more, their stormwater is also. Yes, and that's okay. That's the big deal. So it's gotcha. already a, a, a pretty significant creek and we think it doesn't get the respect that it deserves um, already for that. And it's really, clean water. Um, I know groundwater gets this rap. I mean, people, it just sounds dirty because they call it groundwater, but it's water. Um, we've, we've tested it and it is, it is good, clear water. 
Um, but we've never attempted to measure what Confederation Creek is like during a rainfall event. Um, and so these are the places where we've done our um, measurements. So this is the Trafford Creek that comes in there. This is the McKnight Creek that comes in there. Um, I, would, I would have thought the McKnight was a bit more than that. Um, here we, we measured it where it confluences with Nose Creek um, on Edmonton Trail. This is that little creek I told you about in Queens Park Cemetery. Mm. Um, this is um, an outfall that you can um, see that runs all the time in Confederation Park. Um, and sorry, my two bars in the way. Um, and yeah, another outfall. Um, but they, the city calls these outfalls stormwater outfalls, but they're not stormwater, they're, they're creeks. Um, mm. They do carry stormwater also when necessary, but what they're, a large number of them are doing is actually carrying creek water. Because they're a natural creek. Yeah. Called stormwater to make it sound like it's right. been introduced, I guess, hey? Or... So um, this is, um, one of the sites of Confederation Park. Um, we found this picture. I don't even know how we found this picture, but it was painted by a, a local woman. She lived on Constable Road um, and her husband, um, Mr. Ogle, ran the local convenience store and she painted a number of um, paintings of her surroundings. Um, and so this was the little farm that is where Confederation Golf Course is now. Um, and we heard tell from a lot of um, local people that the fair farm, you can see the water here on the ground. Some of it's moving through and some of it's sort of standing around is sort of marshy and boggy, but people would board their horses here because there was always water. Um, and one of the things that she's showing here in this picture is that this building in the back here, that's St. Francis High School on North Mount Drive. So it's just just a hop and skip jump from North Mount Drive. Um, and this painting um, actually hung in the front hallway of St. Francis, um, at least before the renovation. I haven't been in since the renovation, but they had said that they um, put it away for safekeeping, but they were going to bring it back out. So St. Francis students have been aware that, you know, there's they've been next to water. Um, for a long, long time. There's a really nice comment there. Uh, Kathleen mentioned that she had painted with uh, Betty. Oh, really? Members of the Calgary Community Painters. She said, this is an awesome image to see this evening. Well, I approached the family because I thought, wouldn't that make a great Christmas card for <laughs> Friends of Confederation Creek? And they were surprised to see that, uh, that I had found it. Um, and yeah, I, I never truly followed up with them. Um, but I, I do love the image and um, I think she was very talented. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Confederation Park. This is the part where we get to see the creek, but this is the original plan of Confederation Park as it was presented to the city. Um, so the city to get rid of this blight and this eyesore and this dump um, got together a committee people and they, and they asked um, a man named Eric Musgrave to head it up and he formed the Centennial Park Committee. And so the entire planning and actual construction um, and every detail was done by the cities of citizens of Calgary. It was considered and, and it, well, it's known, it's I think the largest centennial project that happened for 1967 in all of Canada. Um, and then over time, bits and pieces of it um, have sort of been forgotten by us. Um, this is the section that has become known now as Canmore Park, um, but the city has renamed it um, for the Sesquicentennial Centennial as West Confederation Park. But this little piece here was also part of the park. And this piece is important because that's where the creek is, or one of the creeks. And believe that it just, it ran at grade for a while. Um, Mr. Ogle Jr. 
um, told me that his father used to sort of like watch over it on Constable Road um, because it was put in a ditch just beside in front of his house. And what I think is that they eventually just filled it in with dirt. Um, so it's still there, but you, you can't see it. Um, and this little uh, corner here, um, I don't know if it's been built on or what. This is the golf course. And mm -hmm. this, is, this is where Confederation Park comes out again and uh, beautifies the golf course. And then it runs under 14th Street and it runs under 10th Street and then it goes into its vault down here and the Queens Park Cemetery belongs here. But Kathleen, I wanted, I thought one of the reasons why this was a good fit um, yeah. for your group and for tonight was because this part of the park was originally proposed to be a bird sanctuary. Really? And it was going to be a marshy area um and what is now there are the baseball diamonds and the tennis courts so yeah i think that's a, a huge opportunity that we lost um at, so that at, part of the water is not even you can't see that now no that's where you said it's vaulted yeah they vaulted it and, Um, what else did I want to say about this? So yeah, so they, they did all of this work. Every single tree um, in Confederation Park is planted, um, mainly by local groups, including Girl Guides and Scouts and um, oh. churches, church groups and everything. Um, they totally graded the whole valley here though. And they took away its um, natural contours um, to achieve a, um, uh, a park look called English Pastoral. That's um, based sort of on the um, Olmstead, the great guy, the great park designer who did New York City Central Park and other big important parks. They were following his lead. So there's nothing really natural <laughs> about Confederation Park. It's completely constructed for our enjoyment, wow. but it is Calgary's very is Calgary's favorite park, um, and people uh, love it because it's flat. Once you get down the hills, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you can walk around all of these different amenities on the footpaths, and um, and so um, Confederation Park has been called a municipal heritage resource, and. I've wanted to see whether I could follow up to see whether that means that the creek is a municipal heritage resource as well. Um, Someone was asking before you go into the next slide, the name of the park, I think on the side was Canmore and now it's called what? West Confederation Park. Okay. Thank you. They put a sign up, but I don't think, I think people just still call it Canmore Park. Um, so when they were preparing for the Sussex Centennial, they did a bunch of upgrades in the park. They rebuilt um, the um, playground, very similar to how it had been in 1967. Um, and then they put up all of these signs um, um, dotted around the park, explaining um, the park. and. I, again, it puts my nose out of joint a little bit um, because they take credit for this lagoon system. Um, and so they, they, they say, they, they acknowledge that they channeled water into those larger streams and lagoons and they made it easier to develop the facilities like the baseball diamonds where we could have had a marsh. Mm. And they say that, you know, it's the first time that natural features have been used to collect and treat stormwater from the surrounding neighborhoods. And I would say that, yes, it collects it very well, <laughs> but it's definitely, it's not treating it. 
Um, sure. And so I'm not going to take you to this um, calgary.ca about the management of Confederation Park, but if you want to learn more history about Confederation Park and what the plans were back in the day for it, that's, uh, that's an excellent place to go as well. Um, you'll learn quite a bit. Um, one of the things that they did know was that the valley always flooded. And so when they put Confederation Creek back underground, they made the size of the tunnel that it went into fairly small so that that would not let as much water through as wanted to go through. And that's why the water always backs up in Confederation Park, as you'll see in the next slides. So, yes? No, I just so, think, wouldn't it be the opposite when they want it to be a larger? No, they, they want to slow it down. Mm. Um, and so they're willing to sacrifice um, pathways and bridges um, in order to do so. And when I say a short rainfall in June 23rd, 2018, I think it was a three hour rainstorm wow. that caused this. And this is normal. Um, when they redid the viewing platform that overlooks the lagoon, they consciously built it out of, um, well, they, they see they were, weren't quite finished. <laughs> um, they constantly they built it out of like river rock and things that could withstand being submerged when they needed to be. Um, and I'll say here that, you know, the lagoon is very, very well used by all sorts of waterfowl, but God forbid that they built their nests down here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, um, what happens is that the water comes in very, very quickly. Um, and this is a, an actual term used in, in hydrology. It's um, how flashy a creek is. And it means that um, leading to flash floods. Um, and Confederation Creek is considered to be very flashy. Um, can you see where the creek is? In Queens Park Cemetery. Just wow. this is a different uh, rainfall, but that's where the water wants to go, right? And and uh, um, so even though you can't see it in Queens Park, it's still there. Um, the custodians of Queens Park and the City of Calgary know that it's it's a problem there. We don't really talk about Queens Park. Um, because the idea that, you know, the pure people who buried their loved ones on either side of that pathway probably weren't anticipating that. Yeah. Yeah. And they say that when the rain is really strong or when it's coming through, that the manhole covers come off. Which is a hazard. Which is also a hazard, yes. There's a question here. Is anyone trying to get the creek as it runs through Queens Park Cemetery unvaulted? And um, your grandparents are buried. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, potentially, I think there's other places to go first that would be less delicate, difficult, problematic. I mean, if we were to unvault it, then I think we should probably move some of the vaults. And yeah, it always struck me that we use the same terminology for burying a creek as we do for burying people hmm. um, yeah yeah so people in the area know um, about the flooding and they know about where it comes from and so like these are the other creeks that meet in um Highland, the Highland Valley, the formal golf course. And this is where it is. And so it is really the bottleneck of 
all the water that comes from Edgemont um, and Shaganapi Trail down to Center Street comes in through this narrow little dog leg here. Um, and you can still see that there's was lots of agriculture happening around there. But when we were um, trying to learn more about the creek, I think I just asked asked on Twitter, the city of Calgary, about when the vaulting of all of these <coughs> creeks had occurred. And they, they sent us this diagram. And I don't know whether you can see the years um, mm -hmm. in which they were installed. But in 1956, they were already taking water um, down um, 4th Street, down to 40th Avenue. Um, and then in 1962 is when they started doing um, the ones through the creeks. Um, this is uh, 1966, McKnight um, uh, Boulevard. Um, and then clearly this is after the hill slide um, in 1970 in the valley. Um, but once the water went into those tubes, they stopped calling it creek water. It just became storm water. And they just insisted that the water in there was storm water, which is rainwater. That's the, so, I mean, I say the pejorative calling, you know, groundwater groundwater it's it's just water and then if you also want to make something sound scary you call it storm water well it's rain water or mm. it's snow melting right um, but it also meant that they didn't have to treat it in the same way as you actually have to treat a creek um and you know city councilors should have been very familiar <laughs> with this area because it has come before council numerous times, including when the city just got fed up with Addison um, and expropriated the valley because of its importance to the entire area. Um, Addison went to the province and had that expropriation um, overturned. Um, because he said he wasn't offered fair market value and he was planning on building a supermarket amongst other things down there in the valley. Um, so, um, at one time he used to be proud of, of the water features in his golf course. Um, and it was definitely a selling point. And you see his lovely little constructed community up there on the highlands overlooking his, his valley. Um, but the, the, the water in the valley has never gone away. And there are numerous um, um, seeps and little creeks that are still present and are still running um, in, in the golf course. You can, it's, it's private property, but it's fenced off and there is parking off of 44th Avenue. Um, so people have started using it to, as an off-leash dog park. And it really has um, had very little done to it. It gets mowed from time to time, um, but they're leaving the um, sections of land, uh, seats that are feeding a wetland um, pretty much alone. So um, in many places, um, the riparian plants are returning um, and um, the wetland is growing. Um, and that was another one of the concerns that we had was when they did the assessment, the, the biophysical assessment of the property before the de proposed development, they hired people whose um, speciality is doing radio color telemetry for mammals not in assessing wetlands. And so they assess them at a fairly um, lower order than we thought they really should be. Um, we'll see if there's, if there's, um, 
if there will be um, any development, um, there, a new assessment will have to be done and um, they will certainly see that they are considerably larger than they used to be. And they are also being artificially drained into the tomb of, um, of Confederation Creek as it goes through the valley, which is illegal and we have reported it. Um, and um, we did get a visit from um, a provincial sub-minister who thought it was a very efficient control of a, of a wetland. Um, so one of the things that the company AE Engineering um, did when they did this stormwater um, study um, of Confederation Park for the city, um, was they went, oh my goodness, there is so much water here. And the public safety risk is so high that you really have to be taking this seriously. And we know that with climate change, we're going to get more frequent and more intense storms. Yeah. So those little three hour storms that fill up the park, um, could become much, much more serious. Um, and I mean, we don't like to play the, the fear button often, mm -hmm. but you know, um, a man, a man did die. Sorry. Um, on fourth street, he was swept under his car by the water coming down the hill. Um, and, um, and, and that was on a hill and there's, there's his car still looks like it's still dripping. Um, the other thing that A and E engineering, um, noted was that because the, um, the water comes in so quickly, um, should, um, 14th Street and 10th Street and 30th Avenue be considered to be dams because they could be potentially be holding back water up, up to their limit. And we have seen some, some instances when water actually goes over 30th Avenue. And then they um, catastrophized <laughs> what would happen if 14th Street gave way do the water it was holding back in, in the golf course. And they wow. said that it would be a tsunami of water traveling down the coulee. Uh, it would happen so quickly. There'd be no way of warning anyone in the past. And they said that, you know, um, they, they calculated how many souls live around there. And they said, you know, it'd be 80 or 90% mortality. And they didn't even count the condominiums, the Queens Park condominiums at the bottom of 4th Street and 40th Avenue. And there's 900 people that live there. Wow. So a question there as to whether you've talked to Calgary Emergency Management Administration. They're aware of it. Um, hmm. Yes, um, because they're aware of coming out to seeing sites like this. So this is a different, this is a different rainstorm. This is in 2012. So this is the lawn of James Fowler High School. So right in that intersection there. And then that's further across the street in the little shopping plaza. But you can see the level of the water on the cars. Um, Lots of memories so, people have of these events are here. I'm looking forward to hearing more about them after your presentation because people can relate to what you're showing us here. Yeah. Well, and and when those rainfall storms happen, um, if you go down to where Confederation Creek um, actually does finally meet in those creek, that, uh, um, that is the amount of water that is trying to get into Nose Creek when Nose Creek is already full. And it, as you can see, the, the vault is completely full. Um, so this is a bunch of group of people who change makers. 
Um, and one of the things that we said in this um, thing that we did up for the city councillors was that you know you you have to release this report because they were considering keeping the report private. And certainly every single time that they talked about the report, they went in camera um, and we would show up and they'd be like, oh, we're going in camera now. And we're like, yeah, but we know what you're talking about. And we'd wear our Friends of Confederation t-shirts, Confederation Creek t-shirts. So they knew um, what we knew. And so um, this is a stalwart group. There were more of us before it got to be 10 o'clock at night um, waiting to come out and they, they did release the report to the public. Um, you can see it on that very first website um, that uh, I showed you, um, just talking about how much water. And so there was quite a bit of indication um, from people who had said all along that there's just, there's too much water here um, to possibly build as, as was planned on. So, um, other things that this group has done to prove to the city of Calgary that the water that runs through Confederation Park and then goes into the vault is not storm water, is that um, every week for a year, or maybe two years we did it, and now we do it less frequently, is we went and tested the water for Creek Watch, which is this great organization run by River Watch. They test creeks all over Alberta. And we're like, hey, do you test Confederation Creek? And they're like, no, what's that? And we're like, oh, so we, um, I believe I have that. We tested the creek um, for a year and then uh, we, um, they got, we got added to the roster of, of official creeks in Alberta. So the city of Calgary oh. couldn't call us storm water any longer. And sadly, what we also discovered is that of the creeks that are tested by Creek Watch, we are the second worst water quality creek in Alberta. Oh. Yeah. And it's largely due to the salinity because all of that road salt, mm -hmm. um, it comes off the roads, goes right into Confederation Creek. It comes from the turbidity because all of that dirt um, comes off of it. The phosphorus is crazy high too because of all of our fertilizers. Um, so we don't test for E. coli. Um, Creek Watch comes and does that from time to time, but we certainly know it's there. Hmm. Um, and it's not in the groundwater creeks that we tested, um, but it certainly is in that. And that's from all the dog poop and other stuff that just gets washed in. And coyote poop too. I'll, okay, I'll, you know, not just the domesticated canids, um, but um, yeah. yeah, so... We had a lot of fun doing that. Sometimes we had to hack holes in that. Um, and I'm just looking, it's like 8 to 14. I've got more about the infographic. Do we want to take a, a five minute break? Yep, we, can, we can do that, like a break break or would you like questions or it's totally up to you. And how, how are people doing? I, I can't, I mean, it's just an ocean of black out there for me. So well, I see lots of neat comments coming in. Kristen says, let's do the addresses for the map. Let's do the addresses. I'm not sure if I, and Donna says, this is fascinating. I think that we're, as long as you're okay to, to continue. Yeah. Um, just... Oh, for the free map. Oh yes. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you my email address and you can just email me and then we'll figure oh, out something with there postage. We go. There we go. Okay. So what's happened since 2018? And we're still advocating for the creek. We still test its waters. We've held open houses um, with several concerned community associations, some of whom had never heard 
that there were creeks in their communities. Um, we met with, we've met with counselors, we've met with MLAs, we even met with the Minister of the Environment, um, whether it was Shannon Phillips. Um, our present MLA is, um, was the brother of the Minister of the Environment, um, but now there's a new Minister of the Environment as, because um, Jason Nixon has taken on other portfolios. Um, we participated, we, we asked to have a seat at the table at the Nose Creek Watershed Partnership. Then they're doing a, a big mapping project of their own. And we're still trying to raise our voice there to say that we are a tributary to Nose Creek. And we received this grant from the Land Stewardship Center for Consciousness Raising to make this pamphlet called um, Uncovering Confederation Creek. And meanwhile, what's ongoing is uh, we are still trying to overturn the reversal of clown claimability um, of the creek by the province of Alberta. Because after this study came out, the city of Calgary said, look at all this aerial photography, look at the mapping that a &E has done. Um, don't you think that this is actually a creek? And the province said, well, yes, it's a creek. And then two weeks later, they said, oh, no, it's not a creek. Because, um, because they say that one of their surveyors went and surveyed another portion of the creek that had nothing to do with anything that we were looking at. And looked at some really terrible photographs and some really terrible graphs and determined that it was inconclusive. And we have his handwritten note like on the front. It's not even like an actual technical memo. It's a handwritten note on the sheaf of papers um, that says inconclusive. And so the, um, ministry says we do not contradict ourselves and so the previous decision stands and so we've been trying to make the argument that the previous decision was not a decision uh, that it wasn't made with the latest data and um, basically you know you're saying that the engineers of a and e um, aren't worth their salts which is a pretty severe um, discrimination. So that that goes on. We have letters that are going back and forth and they obstinately refuse to understand their own language. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that arose, and we know that the, the, the reason why they also got clued into this was that the developer went to the province and complained that this was now a creek because creeks have rights that stormwater doesn't. Mm. And creeks deserve setbacks from their precious riparian zones. And the setback for a creek can be as much as 35 meters from each bank, which would mean that this, the total setbacks for Confederation Creek would be about 70 meters. Now that's largely accomplished in the park um, and that's largely accomplished in, in where it runs in behind um, um, all of the schools and other things on North Mount, the coulee there. They kept those places green spaces. Um, but 70 meters would be about the entirety of the Highland Valley. Wow. So there, there would be no building in the Highland Valley. Is the setback from the edge of the riparian area or from the edge of the... They say the from the bank. The, the bank, the bed and shores. Hmm. But it would, anyway, it would, be a, it would be a significant, significant amount that would be protected. <coughs> and then this developer... <coughs> has started getting um, a little testy. And um, he has now 
started a lawsuit um, against the city of Calgary. Um, we think there's several employees that are named personally as well um, for $213 million because the city has um, stopped his right to develop in the land. And we've seen his claim and we've seen the um, city's defense. Um, and his claim is that the city's just stalling because they just are taking use of his land um, for stormwater purposes um, and um, not um, giving him any, any joy out of that. And then the city says, um, and, and he has, we have it in print that he, he bought the land before he did his due diligence and that the city had always told him that there was water there. And they had always said that there was a lot of water there. Um, and then they, they also said, you know, you are willing to, if you're willing to revise how you want to develop it there, if you want to do some sort of, you know, slope adaptive townhouses or something like that, you know, there'd be the potential to do that. Um, if you want to resubmit, we'd be happy to talk about it. And he's refused to. So mm -hmm. it's sort of difficult to follow because, um, lay people like us um, aren't actually following the court system that much um, but from time to time we check in and we do have I think most of the correspondence to date. Oh, That's really impressive. Yeah. There's such complex situations. Well and it also means that the city has pretty much have to stop talking to us because there is this lawsuit that's ongoing and, and the developer never talked to us in the first place. So, um, and it means we don't actually talk about the development that much any longer. Yeah. Um, but this is one of the Friends of Confederation Creek. This, this was um, Daryl and um, his uh, milk truck um, <laughs> that he painted up and he would park it in various places, prominent places around the valley um, and um, it was actually seen by um, a photographer, George Weber, and it got featured in Swerve magazine, and he called it the feral beast, because oh, it yeah. lurks in the neighborhoods like a feral beast, and Daryl will update the messaging on it from time to time, but this is, you know, really what, what caught my eye, um, and what Daryl is saying on this, is this, on this truck is, is absolutely the truth. <laughs> just going to read it. So the city plans to destroy this land zoned recreational. 40% is public land. There will be a pathway. First, they plan to remove 98% of the trees, all of the topsoil, bury the wetlands, permanently bury Confederation Creek, fill the valley till flat. Tens of millions of dollars will help the water flow downhill. It's illegal to destroy. Is that water courses? A water course, yeah. Water course, leave Highland Valley to naturalization. Naturalists. Natural, naturalists, I think. Yeah. Wow. So I think he's my hero. That's not, does Daryl still park that truck around? Um, it's been parked for a while because we are sort of at this impasse at the moment, right? There's not much we can complain about because the developer's been told to stop his development. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now, you know, we, we said that we were interested in the health and the good uh, of the creek. And so now we have to walk that walk as well. Yeah. Um, and so this is our infographic and I'm going to take you to the web so I can zoom in and out on it for you guys. This is great. We've got all these tabs. So organized. Well, hope you like it. So here we are up in Edgemont. Mm. You can see that every one of these blue lines is water. They're not all permanent flowing water. Some of them are um, seasonal water with um, snow melt off or rain um, or if there's enough water in the ground, they'll keep seeping through. But, you know, who would think standing up here on the tippy top of the hill in Edgemont that your water was ending up in, um, in Confederation Creek? Wow. 
Um, and then the, the, the city of Calgary provided us this graphic because um, they, they know where all this water is. They know very well yeah. where all this water is. But it, um, it's just, um, if you drive past here on John Lorry, um, you'll sometimes see a lot of deer around here because there's mm -hmm. a lake that appears from time to time. Um, but you can see that it comes down here. We call this the Breeze Bois Bowl because it's a concave area and it's just collecting water down the hill. And you can see that Breeze Bois is a nice curving road, meaning it carries water. Um, and then they brought in all of this other um, creek water together and it's all running in behind. Um, this is Northland Drive. So you can see all the schools that they've put there and they keep the um, water going through the green spaces. But I mean, do you think these people living here in Charleswood know that they're living on top of creeks? Do you think that people that live on the other side of Crowchild Trail know that their creek water is being brought into Confederation Park? Because that's our next stop there to show where the water comes out. Take you to Queens Park Creek, following the watercourse down into the vault of um, the Highland Valley and um, down to where the water comes out and where it meets Mills Creek finally. So, Isn't the first that place. Interesting. So there, there was, there was, we wanted to limit ourselves to five because we thought it would get too busy. Um, but there's numerous places where you can just walk along. If you walk along um, behind any of the high schools and you see a manhole cover, just, just go and listen. Oh, you can, interesting. You'll hear it running. Huh. It's, it's, okay. it's running all the time. Um, so this is the Shaganapi Headwaters Pond, we decided to call it. Um, and here the city is just so aware that it's so much water that it actually puts swales up along John Lorry that you may not notice if you're just driving by at 80 kilometers an hour like we do. Um, and so these are the, the um, information um, points. Um, I don't want to read them aloud for you. Mm -hmm. um, Would you like me to, Simone? Um, I, I don't know what people prefer. I think that people can read on their own, but yeah. most people, um, you know, zooming by there um, yeah. aren't aware of the fact that this is sort of the start of a, a journey of, of something. Um, and then this is um, what it looks like in early spring. So the water level's pretty low. Um, they actually dam it for a bit to build up the bigger pond um, when they open up the golf course in the spring. But if you go here um, in the winter time, um, they, there's now a cross country ski club that um, uses it. Um, year round and there's big signs saying hazard caution don't come close to here because it's it's open water um, because groundwater stays the same temperature um, all the time it's about five or six degrees um, so it is it's always running um, regardless of what the temperature outside is like um, and you remember that they're, they're talking about the wetlands and seeps and springs. And that was that um, painting by Betty Ogle um, showing that area. So the uh, next place is this beautiful creek in Queens Park um, Cemetery. Um, 
And if you enter from 40th Avenue, um, you can actually stand over the ravine that um, it comes in. But if you want to, if you take the entrance that's just before the intersection um, of 40th and 4th Street Northwest, and it's the, um, the entrance that's just behind the Queens Park Village condominium development, you'll drive over a bridge and you'll see where the Queens Park Creek goes underground directly under the Queens Park condominiums like oh wow yeah. okay um but then if you want to have a, a magical experience if you um, go up or you go down that little ravine you can see a creek being born because it's just coming out of the side of the wall a little bit at a time and then another reveal it meets it and and then another one and in the winter time it's really something because in the snow they show up as like these dark marks of something that's like trying to be born um wow. and it's it's really quite something and then it turns into quite a, a chatty babbly little brook by the time it comes together interesting wow and this is what the creek looks like in its vault that's what a, a creek's vault looks like. This is, I have never gone in to the vaulted creek myself. I thought it'd be pretty embarrassing if I um, slipped and fell and had to call 911 and was the president of the Friends of Confederation Creek that had to be uh, rescued. Um, <laughs> but yeah. people have gone in here since they built it. Um, all sorts of neighborhood stories about kids, kids riding their bikes in there. Oh. And you can you can go all the way up to Confederation Park, uh, just following the vault, um, and popping off manhole covers from time to time to check to see where you are. Um, but this is you can see the level of the the water here. Um, this vault is um, twelve feet high by eight feet across, I believe. I have to triple check my numbers. But when it's raining, this vault is full. <laughs> Denise said they rode bikes in the vaults and lifted manhole covers all the time. There you were. <laughs> Would have been great fun. Wow. Um, the comment there too is that seen as a very delicate issue between the city, the developers, developers, and uh, city councilor. They had no idea of the work that's been done to save Confederation Creek. I'm here because I played in Confederation, Confederation Creek as a kid. So it's going down memory lane. I used to play in the vaults and collect frogs and tadpoles in the creek. I lived across the street at Queens Park on 29th Avenue. And then we moved to Constable Road Northwest. I'm so grateful to all of the work you have done to this presentation. They said they've taken a lot for granted. I'm looking forward well, to a map. You know, the problem, we only know what we know. And the problem with these presentations is how much I have to leave out because <laughs> over the years it's such a complicated thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I remember I, the remark about catching the frogs and the fish. There used to be fish in Confederation Creek, and it doesn't have fish any longer, um, which is really um, too bad. There would be some like some species that could survive like a stickleback or something but fish don't like to live in the dark um, and because um, the creek has physically been separated like that entryway yeah. that goes out into nose creek is above the level of nose creek except for when it rains um, the the fish can't go in and out any longer and they don't like the dark anyway and so they would be very reluctant to try to travel, I think it's three kilometers before they could get into the sunshine in Confederation Park. Three kilometers, yeah. And and also like bat habitat, everything else too, like so much depends upon the surface of the of creeks and um, yeah and everything. Wow. I wondered about that with how that is directly affecting habitat. And so fish are being affected. 
fish, the fish are gone. Um, it would be wonderful to have fish there again, because then we would have many more conservation buttons to push yeah. uh, to protect the fish. Um, I think the only fish that you might find might be Prussian carp. Mm. Um, yeah. But um, Mistaskis Institute. Mistaki, a, yeah. Mistaki, yeah. Um, they did a call of the wetland and they did include a site on the golf course. Oh, wow. And I asked them for more information about that. And they told me that it was a city of Calgary employee who was collecting the information and that they couldn't share it because it wasn't theirs to share. I think they thought it was a little nuts Aww. because it was just like, if you found salamanders there, man, that would help us a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where I guess city, um, different community scientist programs, like I, I noticed one of your slides, you mentioned that you've taken part in like city nature challenge, things like that, where, um, yeah anyone here can take part in that too, where you download an app called iNaturalist. And actually we've got a link on our YouTube channel with um, Matt and he explains how that all works. And so say you want to take a walk through a certain area, you or anywhere, you, even like right outside your door, which I'm realizing there's so much wildlife that you don't even notice. Um, but to support something like this, to go for a walk in that area, open up iNaturalist, you can snap pictures all along. You can even do audio recordings of birds you can hear but don't see. So you can just yep. record it, upload it. And then when you get home, you can submit them all. And it has an automated way of recognizing what you submitted. Sometimes it's a larger, more general description of it. But um, the community will... They, everybody reviews each other's and they help identify what you've got in the pictures. So, so you snap yeah. a picture of a salamander, you don't know what it is, but it, you put it on there, people will identify it. And if enough people identify it and confirm that identification it becomes research grade mm -hmm. and um, very, very helpful information um, just by regular people uploading stuff. It's regular people. Well, and, and Matt is, 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 a, is a friend of Friends of Confederation Creek. Um, and so he has actually created like a research area for us. Oh, great. So anytime someone posts something. It directly that, goes in there. It go, directly goes in there and he's building that up. And yeah, I guess that would have been a project I could have done over COVID, but. Um, There's a lot we could have done over COVID. Yeah. Um, Don't feel badly. It's everybody's time is finite and energy and but everything. he he knows how to do that and and so it is there for us and and it is something that yeah could be coming in the future i don't know if um so yeah it's just three kilometers you see that it uh, travels um and needlessly really there's there's no reason why it can run in the in the sunshine um when we open up um so this um pamphlet also has like uh, um a vocabulary sheet um of common riparian terms um definitions and um so one of the the things that we always talk about is daylighting um confederation creek and daylighting is like literally taking it out of the dark and bringing it back into the sunshine yes what okay i always see daylighting trucks and i was like what is daylighting other than the really cute looking um badger on the side of it <laughs> that's something I, so okay well there's something i still need to learn more about is daylighting that's well and, and so people say you know like so why does this matter and, and yeah um i'm like everything Everything from our roofs, from our yards, from our cars, from our roads to our animals to machines or anything else that spills, everything goes straight into those storm sewers. There's, there's absolutely no filters on those storm sewers. There's nothing that even takes out grit or anything like that. Um, and everything goes into Nose Creek and then Nose Creek goes into the bow and then the next the next community over is Chestermere. And I'm going to show you a picture 
of a, a snip of a Google map I did just the other day. Um, I wonder if that was my typing that was bugging people. I apologize. I was writing a little note in there. And Simone, may I just ask your email address to put in the chat because a few people, thank you so much, have messaged me their addresses and such. But if everybody could send their addresses and information through to Simone directly, please, because I won't be able to copy and paste it out of the chat. And if it was my typing that you can hear, I apologize. I'll, I'll mute. I'll be better at that in the future. What email address should people send their uh, addresses to you? It's Friends of Confederation Creek, all one word, at gmail.com. Did I get that? Friends of Confederation Creek at gmail.com. Yeah. Perfect. And I apologize so, for not muting while I was typing. That's all right. Um, one of the nice things about um, Google is you can suggest pins on Google. And um, so they do have a couple of pins about um, Confederation Creek, including, where is it? Sorry. I often get dizzy myself looking at these. I'm just going <laughs> to zoom up. That's okay. But there's there's a, a pin of where Confederation Creek enters the Nose Creek because people don't know where that is. And then there's also a pin about where the three creeks meet in this, recognize this dog leg now. Um, that's the golf course. But if you go down here and if you go down the, the run of Nose Creek and you see it go into the Bow River, and this is just a random day. This is not even a day after a major storm. You can see its confluence here, and you can see what color Nose Creek is. Oh, wow. And Nose Creek is that color because of creeks like Confederation Creek going into it. And then you can see it going downstream. You can see that color continuing. Oh, wow. And then you see this little weir thing that was built? Mm -hmm. That weir was built because the city of Trestamere sued the city of Calgary. Because the city of Calgary was contaminating their water. Because this is the entrance of the Western Irrigation Canal that the city of Trestamere used to take their drinking water from. So, I mean, there's, wow. there's, big, there's big consequences. And so the solution was to try to build this weir, which clearly does not function because you can see it goes here and then it goes bloop, and you can, you can see it going right into the canal. The city of Chestermere no longer uses canal water as their drinking water. We, city of Calgary built pipelines out to them. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes on. Um, that they don't necessarily brag about. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So um, where the creek goes underground in a lot of places, not necessarily in the golf course because of all the trees that were planted there, but certainly in the, um, on the uh, Eastern side of Center Street, there is, there's nothing. It's like a desert. It's just awful. It's just Kentucky bluegrass and some dead pine trees. No kidding. Yeah. Why does it also matter is, is because um, lots of communities and lots of planners, because the city called this storm water, they just assume that that's just water that comes and then it goes away after the rain stops falling. Um, and so there was a condominium being built on the corner of Brisbane and Northmont Drive. And um, there you had used to be a gas station there. Um, so they proposed a three-story building and underground parking and they started digging and they hit water. And we said, well, of course, because there's a creek there. So now that creek water is being pumped out of the underground parking 
24-7, 365 days a year, um, and it's probably being put into a storm sewer, which is really not where it belongs. That's illegal as well. Um, the people, when we met um, the people of North Haven, um, the, uh, they said, oh, well, would that affect, would the creek affect, or creeks around the North Hill, would that affect our, our proposed underpass? Because they wanted a, a safer way to come out of their community getting onto McKnight Boulevard. And we we're like, well, there's a creek there. So yeah, it's, it's going, you're going to hit it. We learned about three houses that were lost to flooding in Dalhousie that um, they came and they said, oh, these houses should never have been built here. Um, and they've, they've, those lots have just never been built on again. Um, but the thing is that because, you know, the, the mapping isn't very accurate and um, the city isn't necessarily upfront with the fact that it's perennial water um, there, there's, there's all sorts of um, repercussions like that. Um, and, you know, birds and mammals, I mean, Matt will tell you on iNaturalist, um, that's, they all need water. And so that's where you go to see birds and mammals. Um, and if you're taking away the water, um, you're taking away the potential for those things. Um, what's to be gained? You know, I think most Calgarians would like to know that they're living in a water catchment and what that necessarily entails. And, and I think that we're pretty um, proud of our nature um, and willing to take responsibility. And if, if they were um, a little bit more aware of how some small things that they could do um, would improve the health of Confederation Creek, I, I do believe Calgarians would try to do it. The other thing is that, you know, way back in 1961, Mayboom said, you know, this is good water. This is good water for a dry, arid place. Um, and I'm not saying that it should be done with the way that the they have Confederation Creek vaulted right now in, with stormwater. But if they could take a few of those groundwater creeks out, um, there would be the potential to um, use that water um, for other different things. Um, the other thing that's happened is, is uh, you can see in the former golf course where the only thing that they've been doing is been mowing for the last six years. Um, so they haven't been putting down fertilizer. They haven't been doing all sorts of things. It's, there's there's now fireflies there. And fireflies only come um, in places that are pristine. Um, all and, right, eh? Yeah, and they need and they need the water as well. Um, if they were to leave it naturalized, imagine it could become that bird sanctuary that we lost to baseball diamonds. And it already actually is acting that way. There's a lot of bird activity around the thing. Um, Daryl, my hero, um, I was looking for his photograph before this, but I didn't find it in time. He found a flock of turkey vultures. Oh, wow. Like 15 to 20 of them just hanging out in the trees. They, we know that Swainson's hawks are there. Um, we think that more and more ducks are starting to nest there. There's a lot of dog activity, though. So Yeah, that's and that's not a true off-leash park. No. So that's not, something that we need to have people respect that and if they're going to go to keep their dogs on leash and such because well, at the moment actually that it's a new bylaw that if you allow mm -hmm. your dog to chase wildlife that is something that you can receive penalty for yeah um well they should send them in there but the problem this thing right now it's private property yeah. right yeah so um they are trespassing in the first place Mm -hmm. And in the second place, it's just become the sort of the, um, the accepted thing is um, that it's it's off leash. Mm -hmm. There's another volunteer that actually has put out their own garbage can, well, and and collects all the poop bags 
brings wow. them back up to be collected by the city. The city of Calgary is not doing that. The dog walkers aren't doing that. It's a Friends of Confederation Creek volunteer who's doing that. No kidding. Thanks to them. Yeah. And then one of the things that people don't, don't understand is that this coulee is like the natural entry for this section of town to go up from Nose Creek all the way to the university. You know, and, and, and Daryl said that there'll, there'll be pathways. And I think, you know, well, I don't really have much of a problem with the pathway because wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to ride your bike or walk all the way from, from Nose Creek all the way up there? Um, so much safer. Mm -hmm. um, and really, you know, it's, it's really a shame that that one section of the coulee was ever in private hands. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you know, what's done is done. Um, but we do know better now. Right. Yeah, that's right. So people then say, Simone, what does the Friends of Confederation Creek want? <laughs> like, what are your demands? It's like you don't really have <laughs> what demands, do we do now, eh? Desires and and you know, goals. Um, so we want to get more awareness for the creek we want calgarians across the city to care about it they care about it in confederation park i mean all the comments are about the sweet little creek and the pond and the ducks and the, you know that's like their favorite thing so why isn't it your favorite thing when it's underground i don't know right um we'd love to daylight the creek as much as possible because that really would improve the health you know, and let let the creek overflow its banks and, you know, when it needs to and come back and give it the room to do that and um, actually have it go slow enough that they would settle out its sediments. There's this fabulous um, professor. His name is Dr. Um He's at the university and he did a project, Detox makes these competitions for urban design from time to time. And he did a project um, about the entire catchment yeah. and it won first prize um, in that one. And so he he's also got these beautiful images of um, the whole neighborhood. And so this is like his proposal for daylighting the creek that water will come through here and a normal flows, it will just continue out here. And this is, I mean, he's, he's not a riparian expert, I'll say, but <laughs> this, is, this is his vision of what the Highland Valley could look like with a little creek flowing through it. And when the water starts getting higher, then it would, could fill up the vault again and excess water could be taken away. I would suggest that, you know, we could make these openings a little bit larger um, and only resort to that at the last resort. But um, mm -hmm. um, there has been work that's done in this. He's, he's also talked about all of these overwide streets that they built in the 1960s and how there's the potential of like lowering the corners so that the water could pool there and not enter the storm sewer as quickly. Um, he's also talked about doing swales all along North Mount Drive so that, um, are you guys familiar with a swale, what a swale is? I'm not. Um, it's a, it's a planting, a deliberate planting that you, um, divert the water from the road into, um, so the plants will absorb, um, the water, but they'll also absorb the dirt of the road. Okay. And not release it into the storm sewers and wow. so it's actually aesthetically pleasing too it's, they looks very nice along the side of roads to have these these plants growing there would be absolutely yeah so by all means this is this is all that he's got on this site here about it but he has more, much more information and the city is aware of some of his ideas and it's not like they haven't had them himself, but if this, if the citizens of Calgary said, Hey, you know, like 
let's slow down the rainwater in Northwest Calgary. I think they might listen. Um, we want to we want to just improve the water quality for for the creek's sake and for everything downstream of the creek's sake. Yeah. Um, ultimately, we'd really like limited or no development whatsoever in the Highland Valley. Um, and ultimately, I mean, you can contact your city councilor. You can contact the city planning commission. You can contact the what what it really takes is contacting and getting involved in the budget discussions because we we really need the city to buy the Highland Valley um, and to fill that missing gap for Calgarians. So that's what we would like, and we would like your help. Uh, and one of the things we'd like your help with, um, for those of you who want to get a copy of this, is I was thinking if I send you 25 of these and a map, will you go and deliver them to people who are living on top of water? Ooh. You oh, can let I see me know. Yes, already. I see you can, yes you can let me know because we have... We, we we're going to target first the places where people are living on top of water that probably have no idea that they're living yeah. on top of water. No kidding. Oh, and there's that was my that's my final ask. That's amazing. Oh, this was oh my goodness, you must be tired. Like that was an incredible. And it's not letting me there. And now I have to say thank you. Aww. Thank you to the Land Stewardship Center for letting us do this. Thank you to the Calgary Urban Species Response Team. You got you guys are not cursed at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I know. Hey, our our we are, we are FOCC, right? <laughs> so, it's hard to come up with a name that you're not it, cursing during it. It is um but thank you so much for this opportunity that's it means a great deal to us we i can i will talk to anybody about the creek at any time of day i'll talk until i'm blue in the, they're blue in the face and running away like my children do all the time um and we have to say thank you to the city of calgary because ultimately in the day i think they're trying to help us help them um, yeah and i think um they're doing what they can I think that so much has to do with just understanding what's going on and yeah. being aware because it is complex. And I think that what you've done here today is to present information in a really understandable way. You've outlined it so well. Um, I'm really grateful. I still want to learn more about daylighting, but I, I have learned a ton from you today and hopefully are you okay to have this on YouTube after? Absolutely. Perfect. Yay. Because we've already got requests for that. And then it makes it easier to share. And, um, and yeah, and to get more of this information out is terrific. Not everybody can put them up later, but I'm really grateful that you're, you're, uh, you're okay with that. And... Yeah, I don't think I said anything I could be sued for. <laughs> No, we're just sharing the information, right? And uh, giving Facts. access to people for that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Absolutely. Um, okay, let's, if it's okay, I'll take your screen share down so people okay. can see ya. And then let me see. So if it, you know, if anybody has a question you'd like to unmute, you are more than welcome to while I scroll through to find. There's probably lots of people that are headed, headed to bedtime, but, and Dana, I see that you just, uh, turned on your camera so feel free neil great to see everybody thank you all so so much for coming we've got another one next week too um and then a regular series starts right after so oh and denise has the, her hand up so go ahead uh hi simone and kathleen thank you very much for this presentation i had no idea how much i was going to enjoy it i was just coming to find out about nose hill and and the creek, because I grew up in the creek, mm -hmm. and I was wet and dirty yeah. from 9 to 14, played with the boys. I have a question, um, and I'm grateful, really grateful to you fighting for the creek, and I, I will put whatever I can to help with this as well. 
Thank you. I have a really interesting insight. Um, what is happening with Treaty 7 and land ownership in Calgary, and how will that affect the future of creek and watersheds? Well, it should, it should, it should be the first priority, uh, in, in our opinion. Um, there, there's supposed to be no developments without consultation with Indigenous people. That is part of one of the policies of the City of Calgary. Um, but I, you, I have never seen that happen. We I have, have a, yes, yes. Uh, the zoo just signed a twenty-five year lease with the Indigenous people to maintain the zoo there. Well, that's that, that's probably the zoo's initiative doing that. I have been following the um, the Indigenous gathering space um, discussion for some time. And they seem to have settled on a site at Fort Calgary, but um, the, the wheels are moving very, very slowly because I, I was, you know, <laughs> thinking of being very helpful and, and saying, you know, like, why don't you use the Highland Park Valley? Um, wouldn't that be a fabulous place? Um, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's my settler to sense worth. Um, we we'll have we have reached out to several groups, um, um, but you know they're they're busy people, and they have their own priorities. Um, and this is I understand why this is not necessarily one of their priorities. That's a but a really good question, isn't it? Because yeah. um, that is coming to light on different um, on different developments. But I'm noticing just generally speaking, because I am not an expert in this at all. I'm just really grateful for the opportunities to learn from our great speakers. But but one kind of, I guess, question I have too on that is, um, it seems like the assessments that are done and then analyzed, um, some of them are, are seem to be quite a few years older. And I do wonder if the time that they were analyzed if there was a different lens. And today, with truth and reconciliation finally being front of mind for us, if today that analysis was done, if it would have a different outcome. And I think that's a really important thing, I think, with everything to be now revisiting that. When was this assessment done? Who yeah. did it? Who was involved with the consultation? When I know consultation is a, not necessarily the word we want to use. Um, it's not necessarily the appropriate one, but what is there in terms of the the artifacts or the the resources, and and who's looking at that, and, and can we have a fresh look at it? I do think it's really important for all of us to keep asking that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if anyone has any help, it'd be very much appreciated. Um, because it is it is something that we're cognizant of. Um, just haven't been able to get around it yet. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Dana, did you wanna ask your question? Nice to have you all. Yes, I was wondering um, about the construction of 14th Street and 10th Street, because I noticed in that last big flood that the water um, uh, was hitting on either side of the vault. Um, it was wider than the vault. Yeah. And it seems to me that if, if those, if those roads were not built as dams, they were not, um, that, that seems to be an engineering flaw. Um, and, and, yeah, the, the description yeah. of having a tsunami through there, I find a little worrisome. Oh, I do too. It, um, you know, I know that fear is a good motivator, but it's not really the motivation because, you know, like they could just do what Addison did, right? They could just put it all underground. Problem solved. Um, and so we, we have to be careful about what we're asking for. Um, but one of the things the city is doing is they are monitoring the water levels um, at those roadways. Um, so they have, if you go and you take a peek um, beside where the um, creek travels underneath, um, there's these things on the side. So they are watching it. We did notice a lot of um, 
piezometers in places. And so those are um, tubes that you stick into the ground and it measures the ground humidity as well. So they are taking it um, more seriously. Um, you know, and, and 14th Street, I, I lived, I, I watched the Confederation Park flood out all the time because I lived on 24th Avenue for several years. And um, uh, what was I going to say? That's okay, because you were talking about how they're using the piezometers and- the... Oh yeah, they're using the piezometers because um, they just never, they, they, they never admitted that there was a water problem. Um, until um, Francois the, the, um, brought it forward uh, and insisted on having this study done. Um, the, um, it was just like, you know, like that's one of the things about living on the valley, but also because it's graded the way it is, um, it also um, is not as dangerous as in the Highland Valley at the moment. Um, because those those walls are more of a formation like on Home Road. Um, and I don't know if people remember what happened on Home Road. There was a massive landslide. Um, and I don't know, the remediation for that is, was mm, enormous. And again, the city was liable. Um, so I don't know even if the... Um, the proposed developer had done any studies about the um, stability of, of the valley walls and how much water um, could be put safely into that valley without affecting them. Because people, I, I often say people think that you put the water in the pipe and then the water is just in the pipe. Well, no, there's water in the pipe, but there's water everywhere. The whole the whole bed is full of water. So there's water all around the pipe. There's water all the way through the old stream bed because it, it wants to be there. It's all the way up through the, the, the walls of the, of the valley as well, right? So it's, it's, it's just moving at different rates, but it's there. It's all water. Sorry, Kathleen, you're muted. It's never, you know, I gotta have one muted situation. Yeah. But that's the one thing about water is where water wants to go, water will go. Hey, it will. And, and it's it, a it powerful force. You think it's such a weak thing, but it, it's truly not. It's powerful. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but uh, there's a little creek that in Beddington that they let go above the surface um, that used to be on Pat Burns Ranch. And people used to come from all around to water their horses there. And so they call it Pioneer Creek or something. It's a lot of, they're long before Pat Burns was there. But literally, they let it run out, out in the open. There's a cairn and with a memorial plaque that has now been stolen for the bronze. And directly across the street from where it goes under is a house. And, and you just look at it and you go, how, how could you not know that your house is built on top of water? Like. Doesn't that bother you? Like, no, apparently not. Wow. North Hill Shopping, you know, North Hill Shopping Center? It's, it was a marsh. Yeah, it was built on a duck pond. So now, no it, way. now it, oh yeah, now it floods um, in the neighborhood just north of it. Every time there's big rain because, because they raised up 16th Avenue and they raised up, um, North Hill Shopping Center. So now the low point is just north of it in Capitol Hill. And that's where it floods now. No. No kidding. Oh, and Denise has got a question when you're ready. Thank you for sharing, Dana. Thank you, Dana. I, it inspired me to ask another question. Um, your share. It, it, it comes to drainage and sediment and erosion control and the bylaws of the city. Have they revisited the bylaws to incorporate the new um, climate controls and also indigenous land <laughs> controls? I'm really going to hype on this indigenous yep. lands because I think they could be supportive 
um, in the in a good way uh, with the right people in place and the right lawyers. Um, but I'm feeling because I live and we've got a drainage problem. And where my grandparents lived in Constable Road, they had a drainage and were flooded in the basement. We had two shop vacs, one in the garage and one in the basement. And we were shop vacuuming all summer long because the house just got flooded. It, it was just part of it. Yeah. And so to me that, and what Dana was saying about building and raising 16th Avenue, this is about uh, erosion, uh, drainage, and all those kind of bylaws. So is there, I don't know what question I'm trying to ask, but I know that there's issues and that there's not enough um, inspection done towards proper drainage and proper erosion and sediment control. Yeah, Simone, is, oh, go ahead. I, I'm finished. Well, I, I, I know that from time to time, the city will admit liability and admit that they goofed um, in some of their engineering. Um, they just did it in the um, community of Rosemont, um, but that was after years of citizens um, complaining about the improper drainage. Um, and I haven't actually wandered around <clears throat> in Rosemont myself, and I should, but my understanding is there aren't any storm sewers in Rosemont. So it just runs off the road and runs. If it gets too high, then it just runs. I'll yes. verify that. We used to go through the manholes in the sewers. There are no storm sewers in Rosemount because it stinks. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and it's dirty. And we used to I'd navigate through them. We used to go from Confederation Park all down 10th Street to Safeways and go buy a chocolate bar and then come home. That's the only reason I'm here is I'm going down memory lane. Yeah, I know I, that's I am just so fascinated by this and had no idea what was going on here. And I'm so grateful to you, Simone. Good fight. Well, it's not just me. I'm just I'm just the, the talking head. Everybody else is off at other board meetings tonight. Well, you're an awesome talking head and to you and yeah, all you of your team. We're <laughs> really grateful. And and I'm so glad to have the the kind of interaction like Dana and Denise are bringing. I think that that's so important to hear this um, information. It's it's great. And I'm looking just back through the there is a very long chat. And so if I'm missing anybody's questions, feel free to write them again at the bottom or go ahead and put your hand up in, in case I know a few people are trickling away um, in case of bedtime or anything like that. If you know, if you loved tonight, Simone will probably, are you coming next week to join us too, Simone? Since I'd like to, yes. I hate to break the, break the series because you've done every one of them so far. So next week we've got Ricardo Ranch, which I know it's not in the north. And I know the north people and the south people of Calgary were a different, you know, it's kind of like Edmonton, Calgary. But if you can tolerate listening to southwest Calgary stuff, there is, or it might even be southeast, actually, I think technically. You have to look now. I think no. it's southeast, yes. Is it? Because it's by yes. Cranston. And, and so just wanted to, like, grateful for everybody to come tonight and have your support is so nice and it's so meaningful for the speakers as well um and next week we've got nathaniel uh, is it schmidt is coming to speak to us about um ricardo ranch and you're gonna see some of the crossover too of different decision making and things like that um so i hope you'll join in i'm just looking back scrolling back at questions um and there was a comment that I wasn't quite sure of the context. So if I say it out loud, maybe somebody could clarify or you might know um, what this was referring to because it was like a, an exemption. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Highwood is excluded. Don, I mentioned that Highwood was excluded and I wasn't sure what that was referring to, but that was quite early on. Not sure if you're able to expand on that. Oh, so let me turn my camera back around this way. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did mention when um Simone, um, hi Simone, I'm hi. on your Facebook page and yes, I'm just you are. totally fascinated. Um always concerned and always been supporting the the um Highland 
uh, golf course or high wood golf course uh, redevelopment. Anyway, um, yeah, so I, I just mentioned that uh, you had mentioned that there was only four communities uh, surrounding the area around oh, Confederation the, Lake and High That's what the city says. There. Yeah. So I just all I mentioned was that I didn't see Highwood on there and I'm in Highwood. Yep. Um That's it. and and Highwood ah. one of the reasons we formed the Friends of Confederation Creek Association, and there were some people that didn't want to, was that if and when we had to try to do something legal, <laughs> um, that we might have legal standing, um, we might be considered affected. And it really irked us that Highwood was never considered to be directly affected by the development when it clearly is. Um, well, it happened to be on our side of fourth that that poor gentleman passed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, they can they can just pick and choose to see who who is affected and who isn't affected, and um, you know, in, in the case of um, between Highland um, Park and Thorncliffe Greenview, it actually it created an enormous rift um, between the communities because they got played off against each other. Hmm. So it was, um, it's still actually ongoing. So. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking as long as you're done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Julie, asked a question earlier on now she had to she wrote me a note she had to go but she's going to watch the recording after so she's got a question here about assuming that this sort of creek water management has also happened in other locations in the city was wondering if there's studies to consider the potential impact of this type of mitigation if the big flood we had and the possibility of future problems well yeah they they've been putting creeks underground um, since Calgary started. Um, and some sometimes they uh, do it a bit better and sometimes they do it worse. I have a Jack Peach article that talks about all of the hidden hydrology around Calgary, um, several examples. And then um, once you start learning about, you know, hydrology and looking at the lay of the land and you're like, well, of course there's a creek there, right? And of course, there's this and that. Um, I know that they did a lot of work down um, in Elbow Park um, after the flood um, because, um, do you know, Elbow Drive and 30th Avenue? Hmm. It goes up into Premier Way and goes up through Mount Royal. Right, it's a winding yeah. road. So guess what I'm going to tell you it is? It's a creek, and yeah, they 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 have put in an enormous catch basin down at the bottom of, of the hill there, um, because there was so much water that blew out through there. Um, Sifton Boulevard is also a creek, um, <laughs> and uh, and and yeah, all 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 around. Town. I mean, Pine Creek and and every every creek that name that you hear probably has other waters diverted into it. I just happen to be passionate about Confederation Creek. Um, we went to visit um, a certain city councilor, and uh, her response to me was, "Simone, you can't hit, you can't stick a spade in the ground in Calgary without hitting water." Right. Like, mm. um, wow. So is, okay, there's a question, uh, if you're, if Friends of Confederation Creek is a registered nonprofit? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, uh, Denise asked this question, if you get information and support from UEP, Stormwater Riparian Group in Water Resources Infrastructure Planning? No. Okay. UEP? No. Yeah, it says UEP, Stormwater Repairing Group in Water Resources Infrastructure Planning. Have you Simone, heard? did you uh, even know that they have an infrastructure repairing group in, with the, the city of Calgary? In the city of Calgary, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, hmm. And they're, 
they're friendly. So I also work with an organization called Calgary River Valleys. Yes, they're good. Um, and so they um, try not to bite the hand that feeds too much. You know, yeah. we try to we try to give input into some of these things. Um, Calgary has a lot of really good policies, but then it also has as many reasons not to follow their policy um, per, per project. Um, it seems that there's always an exception. There's always a something. Um, and I think it, you know, the, the policy people must find it quite frustrating um, because if we were to follow the letter of what our policy says, I think it would save a lot of, um, a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's really interesting to know about too. Um, PB asked if there's anyone at U of C environmental science or urban development departments who might be interested in looking into Confederation Creek. That's a great question. Um, so that was the, the the professor Twelve Klimi. Um, mm. So he did he did that project, and then he also um, assigned um, the area to his students for uh, a year, and so we gave all sorts of um, input and. Uh, met with and re revised students things um, but it, you know it, it's not like curriculum um, at the University of Calgary but I think we have a good ally uh, an excellent ally in Dr. Halimi. Oh fantastic. Um, another just a comment here I'll just read out. Um, uh, from Kathleen, I'm feeling disheartened. I live in Mackenzie down here in the south. We're dealing with the development beyond Cranston on the floodplain. So that I think would be the Ricardo Ranch. Ricardo Ranch. We're talking about last night. So Kathleen, yeah. I'm not sure if you're still on. We might have missed no, you. I don't but, think so. Um, yeah, and I think that Marissa helps us by emailing out to everybody with that information sheet, and then also what's coming up next on Wildlife Wednesday. So thank you for doing that, Marissa. So we'll reach Kathleen that way. But um, she says, I appreciate that you, Simone, and others have been fighting this good fight while most Calgarians like me have been wrapped up in life while the developers have been pushing their way over and through the city of Calgary. Um, and yeah, she'd like a, a letter or something that she can provide to her, her people um, to just support the, support the cause if there's something that can be forwarded. Do you have like pre pre-fill letters or anything on your site? well we we've we've done letters we've done petitions we've done yeah um, oh for sure there is there one there that somebody could take off for themselves um, the wording and use uh there may be something on our website still okay we, we revise them from time to time um but yeah but, but you know we're all downstream from something right um and so i truly yeah, believe yeah. that all calgarians understand that uh, water issues affect us all. Yeah. And I think like, it's just important, like when, um, when we hear about things just to, to gather that information, and then even if you're able to just to share one tweet, one Facebook post or whatever, let, let it be known what your opinion is, call <coughs> your representatives or whatever, inquire, you can just even ask questions and you know, ask if there's certain things that they've looked into, such as the Indigenous piece. Like, it's really important to me that this is followed up. Could you please, you know, I'm not anti-development, but this part's really important. I'm not sure if this has been con considered. Could you please look into that? Um, I think it's always helpful because sometimes that also gives our representatives um, something to to draw on for them to also follow up with as well if we're feeding them that, that information and the inquiry. So, I think that's always uh, always helpful to to get involved, and it's hard because we don't know everything. Like sometimes, like something like this is a complex thing, so you might feel like, "Oh, I can't reach out. I don't, I don't know enough about it." Or, yeah, but that's okay because even those questions that you have, they're important to ask, and it shows that people are interested, which I think is yeah. really important. Cool. It's it's a complex thing, and and it's for, it's made more complex because of the um, size of the development that was proposed. Um, which sort of influenced everything that happened um, at City Hall about it. And people say, oh, you're trying to save a creek, Simone. And then it's like, no, this is actually listed and it's still on um, 
the um, the, the names the the developing you know projects forthcoming in Alberta, massive things like this um, Calgary Economic Developments website mm -hmm. as a billion dollar project. Right. And so it's like, I'm not just trying to save a creek. We're trying to stop a billion dollar project. And, you know, you can't, you can't build a billion dollar project if you can't build a billion dollar project, but boy, they would really like to build a billion dollar project. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um. I see here there's uh oh Denise you're asking about cisterns and repurposing of water. I'm not sure if that's still um... Oh, the more you can do to take keep water on your property and not let it go down the storm sewer, like if everybody get a rain barrel. Right. Everybody redirect your about... gutters into your gardens. Everybody. Yeah. And the one thing I learned about rain barrels was from a somebody who worked in the lab once. He said, just make sure that if you're collecting rain off your asphalt roofs. You use that water for your flower gardens, your native planted gardens, um, or your flower gardens, and uh, but not on your vegetable gardens because of the chemicals that could be coming off of your roof. So that was one thing I hadn't considered until they mentioned that a couple of years ago. So just keep in mind that, but there is definitely use for it. And yeah. to cover it, to make sure that animals don't get into it. Okay, that's enough of my uh, lecturing on that piece. But yeah, you're right. Keep that there. So that's interesting about the cisterns and the repurposing on your own land. Um, Gord mentioned that we have swales in our panorama backyard and it takes our yard runoff and sends it to the street and drains it eventually into Nose Creek. So it scares me what crap is flowing off the lawns. I'll just, yes, I, yeah, I agree. It's, I think swales are, fantastic and they're they're actually an easy retrofit they're not tremendously expensive but very effective and neil mentions he's got some leaflets from climate confluence uh, but could use some more to, to distribute so that's great and thank you for being here yes yeah um, Donna mentioned about urban trees too. So I'm not sure if Donna, if you want to expand on that or if that was like an idea for a future talk. Um, but yeah. No, it's just something that I've been concerned about in our um, communities is a lot of development has been happening um, all around and, and it seems like these huge mature trees are coming down to, um, to accommodate uh, the infills and uh with the mandate of the city yeah. wanting to um work for you know climate control and climate uh, change it seems counterproductive to um to not consider at least a bylaw to um, um as other cities have um vancouver toronto that any tree at the, um needs to be replanted something needs to be there, there should be perhaps some sort of penalty or fee to mm -hmm. um, uh, impose on the trees that are that are being taken down um, because these trees affect not just the property that's being developed but all the other properties around the develop all uh, the community um, as Baron and she said once they are members of our community too and we all enjoy them and when one comes down for uh, sometimes for no apparent reason that we can see, that could be the, the 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 difference between shade on your own house um, or full sun that you end up needing to buy an air conditioner for, which uses energy. Yeah. Anyway, it just seems counterproductive, and I would love to see some this the topic of of urban trees and um, uh, being elevated and discussed uh, in the future. Ah, thank you for that, and I'll take a look to. Um, we're just setting up our talks for starting. Oh, is Simone? Yes. I'll I'll give you a I'll give you a contact. Oh, um, okay. In the Calgary Climate Hub because they're looking at um, a particular style of planting um, that helps the trees grow much more quickly. They they plant them okay. uh, in good company and um, 
because yeah, the city of Calgary recognizes that we are under treat. Right. Um, and they also have will admit that they simply can't afford to water all the trees. Yeah, that's fair. Well, and I think with um, bird friendly Calgary, and also just with even with our name change of Calgary Urban Species Response Team, part of that was because we do focus on birds and bats. But what we have learned is that everything is connected. And um, it's really important that we look at habitat as well. And so even in our own yards, like the microecology right in outside your door to plant some native plants, plant native shrubs, native trees, wherever possible, because the relationship between the insects that depend upon a native species and then the birds that depend upon those insects to feed their babies, things like that are so important. And, um, and learning about snags, something I didn't really know about before becoming involved with uh, Bird Friendly Calgary, because dead trees create really important habitat as well. And and you're right, Donna, that trees are coming down um, quite, you know, I'm not, I don't know the rate at which they're being taken down, but I think it's important that people are aware that, you know, just because there's a tree that's aging doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to go if it can be safely left there or it's in some means keep yeah. it to create habitat for flickers and all kinds there's much better experts on this that can speak on it than me but i think it's really i took a little I, I, a little survey just in the two block radiance radius of my house and in the past eight years 66 mature pine trees came down oh 66. wow yeah. um we had a period in August, I think it was two weeks straight, that it was just chainsaws every single day, all around me. It was just that is terrible. It's it's actually I find it traumatizing to listen to. It's horrible. It's just yeah. horrible to hear. Um, Denise, I see you have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I always have a question. Sorry that's about good. that. But, no, but that's Donna, good. This question makes it great. Donna's uh, comment on trees is right now I live in Winston Heights and um, I'm a renter. And there are seven uh, buildings being built, pairing houses, infills, duplexes, whatever yeah, you want to yeah. call them. And they're million dollar, each side is a million dollar home. Mm. And Every single one of them tore down all the trees. Yeah. Every single one of them. And I cried when they did the one across the street. It was a spruce that was easily, easily 100 years old. And it's gone. And that that's going to take 100 years to replace. And the city has deemed the first, I, I don't know the, the rule or the, the regulation, but the first six feet are was so much distance from the curb from the sidewalk to the inside of the property yeah. is considered city tree and they own the trees in that area mm -hmm. but we're responsible for watering and taking care of them yeah um and i know <laughs> i know this for a fact that every city tree that is owned or in that line has a record number who's is tracking Really? You saw that that map that I showed you. Uh, yeah. The, the, there's maps of all the trees in Cal Calgary. Yeah. Public and, and private trees. They know how their circumference, they know the type of tree they are, they know roughly their age. You can just travel through all of Calgary looking at all of the different trees. So I want to present why is there not a bylaw uh, presented? for regulating trees there's one in toronto because we had a mulberry bush or a mulberry tree or i forget the name sorry i'm not very good That's at trees okay. or stuff That's like okay. this but it was 110 years old and the landlord just wanted to cut it down and people complained and they came and they put a plaque on it and it was a centennial tree could never be cut down unless it dies so why can't with the city of Calgary do something like that? And since we, I know that every tree's got a record. Thank you for supporting me, Simo. Mm -hmm. Why can't there I've be a I've actually looked at some uh, municipalities, sorry. 
Um, oh, I looked at the municipalities and uh, of Toronto and um, Vancouver, and I've sent, I've sent the councillors. I've sent our uh, um, um, our councillor uh, Sean Chu many times. I've actually looked into going public and talking to, um, you know, just getting some awareness to it. And th there are bylaws everywhere in other ma major mun yep. municipalities, but not in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And granted, every tree that's been planted in Calgary, probably, and I'm just talking out of the, out of my hat, but Calgary is not, there were no trees here, unless maybe along the riparian zones, yeah. it's grassland. So pretty much every tree was planted already. But the reason why they were planted is to maintain urban development. So I just find it so short-sighted that... Um, if we're if we're on water, if somebody if somebody from the city council said if you stick a spade in the in the earth, you're going to hit water. You don't need to water trees then because there's water already there. Just mm. leave the trees, and the water will stay, and everything will coexist. But it just seems that nobody's really thinking in the whole picture. Yeah. Do you so. know why the tree has a record? Well, I think urban forestry is trying to make its case, you know, that the trees are really important and and um, show that they have their data. There's a guy that goes and asks for more money for trees from urban forestry to council every budget and every budget he gets turned down. And it's interesting, every tree is an asset and it has to be shown that it was paid for, taken care of, so they have a certain amount of reporting to do for capital assets mm -hmm. and if it's lost they have a capital loss and then if they're maintaining it it's a so it is a budget item Simone you're so right about this but from the city perspective it's a line item in a cost yeah they just see it as a cost yeah and you know this is just the thing is that I think it was Aldo Leopold's son was working with the um, U.S. Uh, um, Army Engineer Corps, just trying to figure out, you know, like, would people value nature more if there was a price tag on it? If we could say exactly how much a tree was worth, how much a bush was worth, a bird was worth, or whatever, and they started working on some formulas for that, so that, um, those people that want to have things quantified could get them quantified. I think the people who want to have things quantified actually don't care about them really. And at the end of the day, you'll find out that the argument wasn't actually financial. It's it's about something else. But that's my cynical view at 938, you guys. <laughs> I have to I have to go and I just wanted to say thank you again to Cal. It's been fun. Oh, you're you're more than welcome, and thank you. It means so much that all of you came, and I'm amazed. Like I actually was getting right. I'm so inspired. It's past nine thirty here, to have so many on and still engaged and excited to talk to you, Simone, about ideas and inspiration about things that we can do. Um, and Neil, see you next week. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I uh, just put a quick uh, link into the chat here through um, Bird Friendly Calgary. There was That's an application that was put together. And if you go through, you'll actually what, see those ones? Okay. all the criteria of what made us bird friendly. And that includes things like the, the different, um, like with urban trees, trees on private land, trees on public and things like that. And, and so you may actually be able to find some resources there with respect to all of your respective interests, which is always important. <sighs> Wow, I am inspired. Thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us. And Simone, you did such a beautiful job. And I just want to mention that anytime we have speakers on, with the exception of when we have Indigenous speakers, everybody comes on with uh, voluntarily with their on their own time and on their own dime. We do not have a budget. We're not funded yet. So um, 
we're not able to pay our speakers <laughs> and everything is done with volunteer hours and behind like with Marissa and Andrew and all the coordination and uh, the time right now and in our speakers all of the preparation time that someone put in and, and her time tonight is something she's done as a gift to us so we're really really grateful Simone and thank you everybody for coming because it's you all that make it well worth all this time too yeah. Simone will agree good to see you Dana all right, I will say good night then. And thank you for coming and um, have a thought for Confederation Creek the next time you go in. Say hi to it.